So our work isn't easy uh, collectively, but it's vital. And I know that recently there has been a lot of talk about the changing landscape and the rural landscape in particular, um, not just in Vermont, but throughout the country. And that many of our towns and villages are experiencing challenges, both environmental and social, that can feel a little bit more pronounced right now. VPR earlier this week, as I expect many of you have seen, released their Rural Life Survey, where they asked 800 Vermonters questions like, how would you rate the quality of life in your community? How well do you think Vermont state elected officials understand challenges facing rural Vermonters? Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of your community? And to be frank, some of the results aren't very encouraging. Nearly half of those polled said they'd advise 18-year-olds to leave the state to build a successful life and career. And we're also struggling um, from the vantage, from at least my vantage here at ANR, with things like making investments in critical infrastructure, roads, bridges, schools, water lines, and sewers, all of which play important roles in ensuring thriving downtowns and village centers. And this work is further complicated by a changing climate, with more frequent and intense storms that are likely to be the new normal, testing aged infrastructure that was not designed for these current conditions even when it was new. These challenges, both environmental and social, require all of us to come to the table to find solutions, to invest in villages that young people want to live in, to create and sustain towns that have a sense of community cohesion rather than isolation, to understand and abide by environmental regulations that keep our drinking water safe and our favorite holes swimmable. There's no question that every Vermont community has its struggles, but there's also no denying that our villages, towns, forests, fields, and the people who live, work, and play in this state are a unique and resilient and creative group, many of whom are in this room here today. In that same VPR story, there were also some more cheerful findings. Nearly 80% of Vermonters rate the, their quality of life in their community as good to excellent, and 66% of those surveyed are optimistic about the future of their town. These high percentages are no doubt in part because of the critical work, critical work you all do every day to support Vermonters, from the overall quality of life in our towns and protecting and restoring Vermont's waters, woods, and wildlife habitat. Today is all about continuing this work by identifying ways we can learn from one another. A and our staff are here today to share information with you, to get to know you, and to hear firsthand and learn from you about what your towns are experiencing. The goal for these conversations is to increase our collective capacity to continue doing good work across the local, regional, and state levels, because we know when we work together, we've been able to accomplish great things for our communities. Uh, and I wanted to take a moment and just reflect on a few wonderful examples of things I've been able to actually view firsthand over the past year. We're reimagining what our downtowns can look like with exciting projects like the groundbreaking at Putnam Block in the heart of Bennington's downtown. Um, this past August, I was able to participate in a ribbon cutting of a $31 million redevelopment project, a partnership with the town, the Bennington County Regional Commission, the state, and private interests that will revitalize downtown Bennington with vibrant mixed use spaces, including office, residential, restaurant, retail, and open space areas. ANR has also worked in partnership with sister agencies and local officials to improve wildlife travel corridors along and across Route 15 and Wolka and Morrisville to increase connectivity for wildlife and decrease car accidents for the traveling public. We are working with ACCD, regional planning commissions and local officials to provide technical assistance and financial support in the development of community scale wastewater projects in some of Vermont's village centers, including Wolka and Burke. We know that investments in village wastewater systems provide an avenue for many of our communities to participate further in economic growth, and it's necessary to make these investments to reverse the decline in grandless values and population um, and to expand the state and local tax base. We, I, uh, just earlier this month, uh, was able to tour the creamery site in Richmond, a former brownfield. This is a site with a complicated industrial past, but really can serve as a cornerstone for larger economic revitalization um, in the Richmond Village. And this first phase was celebrating the completion of the remediation of the site, as well as the first set of apartments being uh, ready for opening. This project represents another incredible partnership between local, regional, and federal, state and federal agencies committed to streamlining these sorts of projects and promoting collaboration and communication. 
We are teaming with local officials and RPCs through the Municipal Roads Grant and Aid Program to make investments in our roads as part of the Municipal Roads General Permit that both make them more resilient uh, and lessen the impacts of road-related runoff on water quality. And we've quite literally um, been working with a community to rebuild main streets together. Um, the Winooski Main Street Revitalization Project, which includes streetscaping in the smallest, highest density city in northern New England, and a strong partnership um, with the city of Winooski and city manager Jesse Baker. Those are the sorts of things that sort of uh, buoy my spirits and keep my heart full. Um, I, and I want to acknowledge that, that those opportunities are real and we are thankful for them. But most of all, I want to thank you. I know that public service is both challenging and underappreciated, and I'm grateful for all you do and look forward to our continued partnership. So thank you for taking time to be here today. And with that, it is my absolute pleasure to be able to intr introduce to all of you uh, Dr. Leslie Ann Dupuy Giraud, who is a professor of geography at the University of Vermont and also serves as Vermont State climatologist. She specializes in climate hazards and severe weather with a special focus on flooding and droughts. And as an applied climatologist, Dr. Dupuy Giraud's research interests intersect a number of interdisciplinary fields, including hydroclimatic natural hazards, climate literacy, as well as the use of remote sensing and GIS in climate research. As the state climatologist, she engages directly with community groups, federal and state agencies, and national climate organizations, facilitating and promoting dialogue among meteorology, climatology, emergency management, agriculture, forestry, and GIS interests. Leslie Ann is also the lead author of a historical climate variability and impacts in North America monograph, which is the first to deal with the use of documentary and other ancillary records for analyzing climate variability and change. She currently serves as the president-elect of the American Association of State Climatologists and was recently named a fellow of the American Meteorological Society. Dr. Dupuy Giraud earned her BS in Physical Geography and Development Studies from the University of Toronto, her Master's in Climate and Hydrology from McGill, and her PhD also from McGill in Climatology and Geographic Information Systems. And I'm thrilled that she is here this morning to talk to all of us um, about some of the impacts of climate change that we're likely to experience here in Vermont, how they may impact municipalities, as well as the bigger picture. Please join me in welcoming Leslie Ann. Well, good morning, everybody, um, and thank you to Secretary Moore for the opportunity to, to come and chat a little bit about some of the, the work that took place with the National Climate Assessment. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the Northeast chapter that I was the lead author for, and then sort of segue into some of the things that we are, are expecting and will probably see and have been seeing in terms of how climate change is, is affecting here um, us in Vermont. Have you seen this visualization before? Some people have, some people haven't. Okay, what is it actually showing you? Well, this comes from the NASA Science Visualization Studio, and what they've done is they've sort of um, got uh, an average period which runs from 1950 to 1980, and they've taken the, this, this snapshot over time going back from 1880 all the way to 2018 and showing you how um, places have either warmed or cooled relative to that 30 year period. And so the places that are blue are places that have cooled and the places that are orange are places that have warmed. Um, as you're going through, you're seeing more and more warming versus any places that are cooling on here. And so I kind of like to, to start with that. Because the other thing that I always like to start with is the, the, the way in which we've sort of um, improved our sophistication of our understanding of how climate changes. And so climate change as a, as a definition, as a term, is not a new one. What's new is our understanding of some of the, the actual linkages and processes and, and complexity with which it sort of plays out. And so if I were giving this talk 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, it would probably have been more of, of a linear approach in terms of our understanding. So you know, um, one aspect of that is adding additional greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, and then how that sort of changes the way in which the, the energy in the atmosphere plays out, and then we see the impacts of that. 
And now as we've gone through time and learned more about the, the interconnectedness of our, our land surface and our ecosystems, we, we see the way in which that sort of um, is more a uh, complex myriad of, of things like changes in, in fluxes, radiation, uh, changes in rainfall patterns, and how all of those sort of come together to, to give us the impacts that we see across the landscape. So this is one of my favorite slides. It's from Puget Sound. And it, it helps to, to sort of encapsulate the ways in which we can look at climate change and work through it. And on the uh, right, the left-hand side, you see uh, all of the ways in which climate change um, as a process kind of occurs, whether it is the, ad the addition of greenhouse gases or whether it's our land use changes and so forth. And then in the middle, where you, you have those sort of salmon and, and reddish places, or places where you're looking at the, the impacts of climate change, and on, on the right-hand side are, are the strategies that we can employ, whether from an adaptive capacity um, perspective or from a mitigative capacity perspective. And so it sort of brings that together. And so one thing that I always ask, just to get a sense of where are you in terms of, of where does this resonate for you? Are you on the, the drivers? Stick your hand up if you are. Impacts? Strategies? And that means there are only 10 people in the room <laughs> because very few people put their hand up for, for any of this. Okay, the, the way in which um, it can either be an abrupt process and we can sort of see jumps through time or the, the way in which we can see trends which are either an increasing value or decreasing value. But the one that sort of hits us most at home is the, the last one on here. And I'm going to try and, and, and do this and walk to one of these slides here. So 
So one of them was something called the state summaries. And so each state has a four-page document that talks specifically about what climate change looks like in that state. And so what you're seeing on here on the right-hand side is a little snippet of the um, state climate summary from Vermont that talks about change in your temperature, change in nighttime conditions, and so on. So if you're interested in sort of delving a little bit deeper, that's one thing that you can actually sort of take a look at. A couple other things that are, are new for, for the fourth national climate assessment, or NCA4, like we like to abbreviate it too, are some of the products that were created from a, a downscale perspective because a lot of the change and a lot of the action happens locally. And so instead of relying on global climate models or regional climate models, we wanted to get that down to more of a local scale to actually see what we can do with the future climate projections. So that was one piece in there. Another piece that was really exciting was for the first time we actually had economic valuation studies in, involved. And so now we can put a dollar amount on some of the change and some of the impacts that you're seeing across the board. So in creating the, the document, uh, we broke down the, the U.S. into various regions, and each region was, was challenged or charged with trying to figure out what was unique to that region in terms of a changing climate, and then sort of speak to that. So when we think about the Northeast, we think about things like the fact that you ever realize how largely rural we are, even though we have a lot of the major cities in our region, like New York and Boston and Philadelphia. And so what is that, that dichotomy? What is that tension between rural and urban? And how does that sort of play out for us? The other thing that we have that this is, is critically important for us is the fact that we have an inland region, a coastal region, and the economies in both of those places are really different. Uh, because this region has been settled for such a long time, one of the first places that it has been settled, as, as Julie was mentioning before, a lot of our transportation issues are part of the fact that we have been in place for at least 200 years, right? And so that length of settlement sort of comes into play. And also critically important for us is the importance of our cultural heritage, um, because it, it sort of identifies us as, as folks who live in the Northeast, and how, how do we sort of honor and treasure that see how it affects us from a changing climate perspective. And then the last thing is, of course, we've got that sort of all the way from the mountains to the coastal regions, and that sets of particular um, challenges from, from a, a topographic perspective in looking at how various elements of our climate can affect us as, as Northeasterners. One of the fun things about this particular report was that it is framed from a, a risk-based perspective. So instead of only looking at science, we were tasked with, with trying to think about what is at risk in our region? Who is at risk in our region? Who is vulnerable? Which aspects of our economy are vulnerable? And then what are the potential tipping points that could sort of drive us into um, an undesirable state? And so those are some of the questions that we sort of spoke to and, and, and wrote about in, in putting together each of these. And this was not done in a vacuum. It involved a lot of sort of outreach across each region to actually sort of pull in all the great case studies and examples, things like Reggie, all the things that are being um, set in place across, let's say, the Northeast, for example. And how can we make sure that those are, are well represented in terms of the things that are, are actually taking place? So we had a number of these different workshops, a number of these different calls at least two or three um, times and moments when we can um, solicit information and feedback from, from everybody who lived in the region to actually make sure that the report was better. So I gave one of these talks at the American Meteorological Society meeting in Phoenix in January, and I literally read through all of the, the, the summaries from each region, the, the 10 regions, and I thought, you know, we were going to be very, very unique in terms of some things that affect chapters that uh, spoke to the different regions, and you can see these listed on here. With the exception of, of our inland states, pretty much everybody talked about the way that sea level rise was affecting um, the economies of, of their, their particular region. We talked about human health conditions, whether it was from an air pollution perspective or waterborne or tick-borne diseases. 
we talked about the ways in which changing climate um, affects like, indigenous peoples and their livelihoods, their communities, their identity. We talked about the way in which um, adaptive capacity is being challenged very strongly by our changing climate. Um, the impacts of infrastructure, the impacts of transportation, so forth, are all things that each one of our regions actually sort of address in various chapters. So let me walk you through the five, what are called key messages that, that came out of our report. So thinking about all of those things that are unique to us, there are five things that we sort of, sort of focused in on. The first one is the fact that the seasons are changing across the Northeast. And with that are coming uh, changes in terms of our, our rural economies, our rural livelihoods, our rural ecosystems. And that sets up a, a, a very interesting um, and important point because it has a recreation perspective, it has a tourism perspective, it also has um, a forestry perspective and other fauna and flora perspectives. So that's the first key message. It talks about seasonality and it talks about us as, as a rural um, part of and in, in looking at that, so it tease out a lot of this um, from a sort of inland versus rural, pers uh, inland versus um, coastal perspective, and we can sort of uh, sort of pull out all of the places in which that is going to become critically important for us on the interior parts of our landscape, and try to figure out what does this look like, or what will this look like in the future from an, an economic perspective, from an agricultural perspective. But in particular, uh, what this slide is showing you is changes in the growing season, uh, either currently or at two different times in the future. So on the left-hand side, all of the panels on the left-hand side uh, are showing you the time when we have the last freeze in the springtime. And on the right-hand panel, we're seeing the time when you have the first freeze in the fall. So in between, you have the freeze, the free season, which is when you have the growing season. So the top panel where you see a lot of oranges and, and, and yellows is, is looking at what are called representative concentration pathways, or the, the sort of um, what would happen if we did nothing, what would happen if we uh, stay back on, on emissions, and, and those sorts of things. So four is one of the, the, the um, sort of lower scenarios. And when we look at that, yellows mean anywhere between six to 10 days of a change in our growing season. And the middle panel shows you the same information but for RCP 8.5. This is one of the higher end emission scenarios where things um, are either business as usual or going in the wrong direction. So what you're seeing here, um, I'm getting into more the, the oranges and reds, so anywhere between at least 18 days of a change in your growing season. All right, one of the other pieces in terms of this rurality and, and changes in the season that we we're observing is changes in your uh, snow melt, changing the timing that that has for um, stream flow patterns. And so this is some work that um, Glenn Hodgkins at the USGS did. And looking at the way in which pretty much across the board from the North Country perspective, we're seeing um, snow melt occurring at least 10 days earlier. Okay, so again, this is sort of playing into a lot of the observations that um, you probably are making both as an agency, but also in terms of your own personal observations. So the second key message stays with the physical landscape, but this time it goes to the coastal and ocean pieces. And in, in this particular one, we're looking at the fact that a lot of the changes along the coast, a lot of the changes along the ocean right offshore are occurring faster in the Northeast than they are in other regions around the US. And so that sets up particular challenges for us from a, a commerce perspective, from a tourism perspective, from a, a economic livelihood perspective, from, from a fishing perspective, for example. And so we sort of tease through how that might actually play out. So Erica Lenz, again, at the USGS, created this graphic from scratch to show the way in which uh, sea level rise and coastal changes could actually um, play out across a region from a built perspective, but also from a, a physical geography perspective, or a barrier islands being affected. Um, by sea level rise and amplified when we have 
storms like Sandy and Irene sort of making landfall in, in some of these places in here. So the third key message looks at the interconnectedness between the rural parts of our landscape and the urban parts of our landscape, and the fact that they're, they're co-dependent and cannot be separated from each other from a cultural perspective, from an economic perspective. And what are some of the specific challenges that we have in our urban areas? And those include things like um, flooding issues that are, are slightly different from the flooding issues that we have um, in, in the North Country here, because again, of the length of the settlement, the type of settlement, and how that plays out for us in, in things like um, Newsom's flooding, King Tide flooding, and so forth. And one of the things that we observed in terms of an um, adaptation or response to, to some of these, these flood concerns was in some ways in New York that got particularly flooded uh, during Sandy, what could be done to sort of mitigate against that? And so this is one of the, the, the new ways in which a lot of the infrastructure has been um, rebuilt so that the grates over the, 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 the entries to the subways are now elevated in, in a, an attempt to, to prevent a lot of the flood waters getting into the subways as quickly as they did and then shutting down uh, one of the most important and highly trafficked um, uh, subway systems in the world. So again, bringing in some of the case studies, bringing in some of the local examples of, of impacts, but also uh, what could be done to, to mitigate against some of the impacts of climate change. The fourth key message was a little bit different because the fourth key message actually talked about us as people and the human health implications of, of a changing climate, all the way from um, ticks, Lyme disease, waterborne diseases, air pollution events, for example. But it, it also looked at the ways in which uh, some populations are, are going to be a little bit more vulnerable because they're outside more often. And we can think about uh, the migrant workers who work in different places across the Northeast. We can think about um, different crews who are, are more exposed to different types of conditions and what that means for us in terms of press to so human health. So these are some um, um, studies that were done in Rhode Island in looking at hospital room visits, which is one way in which you can actually sort of quantify how things are changing in, in, in a human health perspective, and looking to see how the changes in your temperatures are actually um, affecting some of those um, dynamics that we're looking at here. Now, the last key message was all about adaptation. And part of that was because there's a lot of awesome work that we are doing across the Northeast. And so this is one way to sort of highlight some of those success stories as a way of sort of being a, an exemplar of other regions across the state, sorry, other regions across the country, but also because we had gone through the entire um, process and found maybe we need to end on a, a, a lighter note that actually allows us to be hopeful because there are so many success stories and case studies that we can um, bring to bear. And so that last key message actually sort of takes us through. So all of this wouldn't have been possible without um, all of the, the folks that you see on this particular slide. These are the, the people who did a lot of the evidence in terms of the writing that I'd be most remiss if I didn't um, end with this slide, as well as a lot of the folks who provided technical assistance, a lot of the maps that you saw um, in, in the report itself, a lot of the case studies were also contributed by the folks that you see on this slide here. So um, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at the report, it's found on this particular website. Um, if you'd like to go back and then sort of go back through and take a look at this. All right, so here's a basic question. What does climate change look like in Vermont if I were to ask this? Maybe I should ask it because you've been very, very quiet, <laughs> apart from your question. What do you think climate change looks like in Vermont? Longer mud seasons, okay. And in the back?
and ten storms. Four and ten storms, okay. And greater impacts on Lisha and Plain Sedimentation. Got you the first time this time. <laughs> All right, how about this side? Yeah, just more extreme, so relate to the ten storms. More heat, more cold, more extremes in general. Sugar and grunts in January. Sugar and grunts in January. Hi. One of them is, of course, Lake Champlain. It changes on Lake Champlain. And I like to think of Lake Champlain as an integrator because it has all of this coming from the east side, from Vermont side, from the New York side. And then changes that are occurring on the landscape are going to end up being reflected in the lake itself. And so one thing that we have a very long record on is the, the time when the, the, the lake is gone ice out completely and how less frequent that is, if at all, and the extent to which it's occurring and the date at which it's occurring. So all the stuff that, that you said in terms of timing and dates and extremes all kind of get played into here. Uh, another way that we can see this is um, something that's called a, a backward spring. And a backward spring means that the temperatures are going in the opposite direction in springtime. So in other words, instead of warming up, it's getting cooler. And you might see things like snow falling in April and May. Have you seen that? Some of the things that we're seeing in terms of uh, Vermont changes in, in the climate include, you know those nighttime temperatures? So let's say daily low, I'm talking about how low the temperature gets at night. Those are actually not getting as low as they used to be. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that a lot of things like overwintering of things like ticks are, are not occurring as much, right? So this, this, this low time temperature at night, uh, if you look at it across different seasons, you'll see different patterns. So you've got winter on the upper left here, summer here, um, spring here and fall here, and, and the, the way in which that changes over um, the 100 plus years looks at, at how um, that, that minimum temperature getting warmer is important for us across different parts of the state. The other thing that we can look at is this precipitation, and again, uh, winter on the left, followed by summer, spring, and fall, and the way in which that, that change in your, ch in your precipitation over, over time from a seasonal perspective is important. Now, when I, when I show this, I ask, does it matter to you which season is getting wetter? And the answer is invariably, invariably yes, because especially from an agricultural perspective, perspective knowing if it's the fall that's getting wetter will affect things like the, the, the choices or decisions that are made in terms of planting or harvesting and so forth. So knowing the seasonality of things like these changes in precipitation is important. So if I had to ask, and I won't, what are the sectors that are the most vulnerable or susceptible to a changing climate? One that you would probably say is agriculture. I know I said I wasn't going to ask, but I did anyway. Um, agriculture, what else? Ski industry, what else? Tourism, OK. Forestry. Forestry, OK. So let's work with that. Let's talk about human health for a second. And in, in human health, because of where we are, because we're inland, because we're north, we are acclimated to different conditions than our relatives or our colleagues who live further south or coastal places. And so one of the things that we observe um, is a change in terms of the uh, threshold at which we need to actually start uh, to, to think about um, when, when do we warn for the changes in temperature? And so then we now have a new value of 87 degrees that when it hits 87 degrees in the summertime, the National Weather Service and the Vermont Department of Health will actually put up a warning. Because we don't have to wait until we get to 90 degrees to, to warn for, for, for um, heat extremes, because we're not acclimated to heat extremes that are that high. And so at 87 degrees, we actually see more hospital visits. So that's one thing that's, that's a change, OK? So make sure that you are tuned in to, to that 87 degree when you hear some of those warnings going on. The other thing that we can look at in terms of human health are Lyme disease, as we talked about. The fact that um, we can look at the way in which 
uh, like I said, overwintering of ticks is not occurring at the same rate as before. Ozone conditions and, and the way in which our topography sets up just the right type of, of landscape for having stagnation events. And then um, our folks moving into our region because it's a little bit more desirable. So looking at that find the refugees is another piece that we can look at with human health. So here is the, um, the little chart that um, one service in the Department of Health had looked at to, look to, to sort of come up with that brand new um, 87 degree cutoff. And so you can see the, the variations across the state really well. The Northeast Kingdom, which is higher in elevation, colder, fewer of those extreme events in terms of um, heat waves. The southeast part of the state, which actually looks more like New Hampshire than the rest of it, than the rest of the state, and then the banana belt in Shelving Valley, which is the warmest part of, of the region. So when are those days going to hit 87 degrees more frequently? Second thing that we can look at is, is looking at, at, at uh, vegetation. When I say vegetation, I'm talking about everything that includes forestry, agriculture, anything that is, 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 is growing, essentially. So what can we look at here? Well, one way that we have seen the climate is, is changing and, and occurring is that the planet hardiness maps have changed. And those of you who um, use this to select the varieties that you grow in your garden or, or plant know that this has, has occurred and you know that the zones have shifted a little bit. So on the left-hand side is the older map, on, on the right-hand side is the Arbor Day Foundation map. And I absolutely love this one because it is, it's, a, it's a GIS-based map, so you can actually zoom in and out and get down to the, the, the individual parts of the landscape that you're interested with a lot more accuracy and precision than you would have been able to do on the left-hand side of the paper map. Okay? So we can look and see how that's already um, factoring into some of these changes. If we think about agriculture, we think about different types of, of, of species that are planted. How does changing um, temperature, precipitation, drought at different times of the year affect us? And what does that mean in terms of our economic life? What does that mean in terms of um, in individual vulnerabilities or, or larger scale vulnerabilities? And um, when I was giving a version of this talk back uh, at, at um, the Wake Robin in, in March, just before that, like two days before, on the front page of the Free Press, there was this, um, this, this, this story about a farmer who had a, a GoFundMe site because of the challenges that he had experienced um, over the course of the last winter and, the, and his inability to actually uh, procure feed. And so, again, uh, more of an economic impact in, in looking at how changes in the climate affect us uh, from an economic perspective. Uh, looking at it from a more of a forestry um, uh, perspective, what we're going to see across in here, again, from more of a seasonal dynamic, how some of these things are affecting us. And so there's a species that has now been observed for the first time. Is it the Woolia delta? Okay, so the Woolia delta, I think this is the second year that it's been observed here in the state. It's an invasive pest that had not um, made its way to the state so far. And so it's one of those things that are, uh, is being um, very carefully tracked because it, it's one of these pieces that is, is brand new for us and now it's going to be a, an additional um, threat that we're going to be uh, working through. Um, other threats that we can look at as, as, as our climate changes include things like what are our droughts occurring? What does that mean for things like fall foliage? What does that mean for our agricultural patterns and, and so forth? And in, in looking at some of these species that are critically important to us as, as a state, um, sugar maples, one of the, the, the sort of economic um, staples of our livelihood from a fall foliage perspective. And Underhill has a, a site where uh, Forest Parks and Rec have been monitoring the changes in, in your growing season for the last uh, few decades and looking to see how that length of the growing season is, is increasing and what does that mean for, for sugaring and so forth. So the other part of that coin is not just the length of the growing season, but when does your um, outbreak actually occur? Because if it occurs too soon and then we run into a frost, we have that additional challenge to sort of take into account. And then the last thing on here is, is 
ground level ozone. Again, so ground level ozone is ozone that's produced at the levels that we walk around in um, by driving around and other processes, forest fires or another one. It's important from a human health perspective because it's an irritant for us as human beings, but it is also important from a, a, a vegetation perspective because it also is an irritant for plants. So if warming conditions are conducive to our ozone at the ground levels, this is going to be uh, of importance to us from those two um, particular sectors. And then keeping in that sort of um, sugar maple, ozone, white poplar, tourism um, at, uh, perspective, where we can look at the ways in which, again, things like drought conditions, things like um, when we have more snowfall, less snowfall, less reliable snowfall, how is that going to affect us from a, a cold season perspective, from a tourism perspective, and how some of those changes in Lake Champlain are also going to be critically important from a recreation but also tourism perspective. And so a uh, couple shots from um, the St. Albans Bay area. You know that place where you can a nice little picnic pull-off in St. Albans Bay that you've probably gone to a picnic back. So, that had been in place pretty much for that entire year because the water levels should be where this damp sand is. But the lake was at least 15 or 20 feet out because of how much the lake level had dropped over the entire summer. So, so, so drought conditions, lake level conditions, um, where the official Lake Champlain is also going to be critically important for us. Now the flip side of that, and this is these extremes again, to flood, sometimes all in the same year. This is from earlier this year when we had flooding along Lake Champlain. So this is the King Street Ferry Dock. And I went and took pictures in the same places that I took pictures back in 2011 because things were starting to ramp up and look like they were going to be a, a repeat of 2011. But fortunately, we didn't have that because the um, entire system wasn't as, as, as wet as it was in 2011. So we, we fortunately dodged a bullet here. But that doesn't mean that to negate the fact that flooding along the lakes is still critically important from an economic perspective. And then when we think about infrastructure, we think about, you know, as Julie's mentioning, the way in which a lot of excessive precipitation affects our, our roads and, and, and so forth. A couple of the pieces that we bring in from an infrastructure perspective include things like our critical infrastructure, which is where emergency management comes in, include things like our electrical grid, include things like our water supplies and the way in which those might be affected. So looking at the way in which climate change plays out from an extreme perspective, from an infrastructure perspective, and, and how that affects us individually, how that affects us collectively, um, is one of those pieces that we need to sort of factor in, plan for, and, and work through as, as we continue to move on through in here. Vermont has specific challenges, which include the fact that our topography is, is a very challenging um, part of, of who we are. And I'm going to have to put the mic down for this. But you ever realize how a lot of our, our roads and rivers are in the same place? And so that means that in a lot of cases, the roads and the rivers are juxtaposed. They're sometimes like two feet apart because there's no other space to put. And so when, when you think about what that means from a vulnerability perspective, um, it came to bear in, in the, the worst um, scenario possible that we had Irene in the case of a water ferry because here's I-89, there's the Mississippi River, and we had that sort of isolation occurring when it got, um, the industry sort of jumped the banks, right? So how does this sort of juxtaposition play out for us? And when we think about the plan for our downtown areas, how are we going to include some of the possibilities that could be in place? So this map um, was created by Jonathan Croft. Uh, in, in V-Trans, and what it shows is, is a, an overlay of 1927 flood, which was, was the flood of Red for most of the state before Irene. So that's not the sort of uh, brown parchment looking um, part of the diagram here, all the, the darker lines are here, 1927 flood lines. And what Jonathan did was to superimpose the places that flooded in 
high green. And so those are these um, lighter colors, be it the, the greens, the yellows, the reds, all indicating the extended damage along various roads. And they match like this, okay? Because the roads haven't changed in the last 100 years. And so what that means is we actually have a, a leg up on where the vulnerabilities are, because we've seen where a lot of these flood events have occurred in the past. So we know targets and resources because there's been repeat flooding in a lot of those places. So we've got a little blow up of the middle part of, of that map that Jonathan created. Again, just to show that that sort of very nice one-to-one -one relationship between the 2011 flooding, which are the colored regions, and then the darker lines, which are your 1927 flood lines. So a lot of, of the, the, the sort of extremes that are critically important for us uh, as, as a state things like uh, tropical cyclones, be it hurricanes or, or tropi tropical storms themselves. And the ones that usually can do those damage are the ones that either move directly up the coast and then into the Champlain Valley, like the Long Island Express did across the here, or they give us a, black, a glancing blow, like uh, Hurricane Floyd did, or following a very, very similar track as Floyd was Irene. Now, the difference between what the amount of precipitation and the flooding that occurs in each of these different types of events is due to the fact of what the landscape looked like just before the hurricane moved through. So, I mean, about eight inches of rain produced severe amounts of flood. Um, it was preceded by a couple of weeks of, of heavy rain. It was preceded by uh, a few months of, of, of rain where we had that springtime flooding occurring. Floyd actually dumped 14 inches of rain on the top of Mansfield, but there was not a stitch of flooding. You know why? We were coming out of an 18-month drought. And so knowing what your landscape it looks like ahead of time when we have some of these extreme events kind of moving through is going to help us to, to understand whether we need to prepare for a flood or if it's going to be uh, business as usual. So just really, really quickly, focusing on hurricanes because they are one of those um, relatively quick systems that do affect us flooding-wise, we can take a look at why this is going to be the case and why the hurricanes sort of exacerbate a lot of the, the climate change signals that we're seeing. And part of it has to do with they're occurring in, in a, an atmosphere that has more moisture in it. They're occurring in sea level conditions that are now higher than they have been in the past. They're occurring over warmer oceans, and so the storms themselves are going to be larger. They're going to have more precipitation in them, and so when they make landfall, they're going to uh, pose particular problems. The other thing is, did you know that the hurricanes are actually moving slower? Okay, the hurricanes are slowing down, which is which is problematic because a hurricane that slows down has a chance to actually dump more precipitation in place than if it moves. Quickly. So Dorian was a great example, right? Dorian sat, unfortunately, over uh, the Bahamas for at least a day and, and produced a tremendous amount of damage, tremendous amount of evacuation needed to occur because of that stalling. And so looking at that, how our hurricanes are changing it is, is also important to us. So when we look at this and we try to figure out, can we do something, can we work with these changes? One of the answers is yes. And the NOAA Atlas 14 um, is a product that came out about five, six years ago. And Nick Warp, again, a beach man, actually works with this because when you have to answer the question, are my culverts being sized correctly? You want to be using the most up-to-date information to, to do that sizing. And so the, the Atlas 14 allows you to, to, to pinpoint what the extreme values are at different parts of, of the, the, the US at a level that can be worked with. And so when we look at this, the yellow lines were the lines from the TP40, the technical report from the 1940s, which is what we had been working with for all of this time. And you see how few lines there are? There are like five lines out there. And that means you have to interpolate between each of them to figure out what value should I be using for my culvert sizing, for example. So now that you have a, a geospatial way of doing your 
extreme precipitation, that's going to improve the, the types of atlases that we get before we put them on the landscape itself. So Atlas 14 allows us to do that. Okay, so one of the things we're seeing is as all of these uh, different types of events, whether they're floods, droughts, um, different types of catastrophes are increasing, the one that always surprises people is, is the meteorological events, so these green bars in here. Those are the ones that are increasing the most, okay? Those are the ones that are at the largest in terms of, of the types of events that there are. So even though flooding is, is very visible, it's not the type of event that is increasing the most um, because it falls on the hydrologic types of events here. And so knowing what it is you're dealing with is part of the challenge in making the choices and decisions that need to be in place. And so one other way of dicing this is putting a dollar amount on it. So if you ever Google billion dollar disasters, what you will see are all the disasters going all the way back to 1980 that produce at least a billion dollars worth of damage. And they sort of uh, correct this for inflation each year. So you can actually see that. So the one that causes the most billion dollar disaster is not stuff like flooding. It's, it's still things like severe storms. Okay, and so we're on track again. This is this is like this is 2019. We're on track again to having severe storms be one of the biggest contributors to uh, billion dollar disasters across the region. So just a couple examples of what those might look like. They could be ice storms. They could be tornadoes. They could be hurricanes. But they vary by region and they vary by year. So 2017 on the left, 2018 on the right. So all of this, and I've thrown a lot at you, and it seems like it's like the kitchen sink. And the, the reason behind that is because there's so many moving pieces, so many moving elements, so many moving things to kind of keep in mind to help us understand what, what we need to look at from a climate, climate change perspective. And so pretty much the only way that we're going to do this is to have a systems-based approach with making sure that we're factoring all elements of the human system and the physical system in place. Um, the other thing that we need to do is, is to make sure that we are looking at things from multiple dimensions, multiple scales, both in space and in time. And as we do that, um, the best way to make sure that we're not missing anything is to do a multi-hazard perspective, because that way you're going to get all of the different types of, of elements, whether they're hydrologic or meteorologic and so forth, that are going to be affecting us at different parts of our landscape. And as, as we do that, we think about um, the fact that it's not just one type of vulnerability, not one population is vulnerable, but there are many and multiple uh, they're co types of vulnerabilities, and they're interconnected in here. And so um, just to bring it back to, to where I am, the space that I'm physically standing in here, a lot of one of the things that you can sort of continue to move forward and continue to show a lot of leadership on include a lot of things that we are having in place or planning in terms of zoning and other ways that we can um, reimagine what our flood things look like, reimagine the way in which we can do our resilience. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions or would like any slides, please my contact information is across here. So we have time for maybe two or three questions. Would anyone like to ask one? Uh, I've got a question. Um, one of the things that uh, I think maybe was left out, uh, your presentation was great, is the mental health impacts of um, climate change and disasters. And could you speak a little bit about that? Because I think a lot more has been learned, especially impacts from um, the uh, Orleans flooding, the New Orleans flooding. Katrina, yes. Could you speak to the mental health impact, please? So, I, I, if I remember correctly, there are, are elements of um, post-traumatic stress disorder that um, psychologists have identified with um, the, the survivors of a lot of, of events that are either, either natural disaster events or changes in, in, in economic um, environments, changes in livelihoods. And so I think to the extent that we can use a lot of the, the work and the understanding and the practice, the strategies, the, the empathy that comes out of something 
like um, the knowledge of, of PTSD to help us with um, the, the ways in which we interact and, and help to support people who are going through various elements, whether it's a loss of a farm or whether it's living through a particular flood event or something like that. We have somewhere to start, is what I'm trying to say. And, and that is this one piece that I know for sure has been deployed. I had thought that PTSD was from the Vietnam War. A year after Irene, I learned it was from family in maybe like Montana, Missouri, somewhere. They lost their home. All of them couldn't sleep when every time it rained, and that's where PTSD was developed. Thank you for sharing that. Please join me in thanking Leslie and.